But here's our objective for this one. I can determine if conclusions and data are valid or not valid based on a survey or population. So take one minute and copy this down, please. Here's some vocabulary for statistics. Of course, some people would say, just cross out this garbage and put lies, and that would be fine, I suppose. Uh, but surveys is usually how we come up with statistics, or uh, when we, like in the, last, in the first part of this unit, we talked about probabilities, right? So survey, um, uh, if you perform an experiment, that, is, that would also be considered results for a survey. Just surveys, usually you go to people and ask questions, right? Now, of course, if you want to be highly manipulative on this stuff, you can be. And for the most part, I would say, especially in mainstream media, it is. You'll have to find out later why. But population would be members of a group. Sample is like if you take a full population and only look at parts of that population. Uh, so that's the big difference here. I don't necessarily use this vocabulary, but you'll see it. And for some reason, they want you to know the difference. So here we go. Now, if we compare, I know you're still copying this stuff down, but if we compare surveys to experiments and you look at the two types of probability, remember you got theoretical probability and experimental probability, um, surveys, once you actually perform a survey, it's the same thing as performing an experiment, like I just said. So the results of surveys generally are considered experimental type probabilities. Well, what they do with those, th that type of information and probabilities is they say, now I will predict the future. And of course, it is used extensively in politics. It is used extensively in advertising as well, which should tell you a lot about politics. For each survey topic, determine which set represents the population and which represents the sample, a sample of the population, right population or sample, okay. So here we're looking at uh, the topic is dress code changes. And so set A is the students in a middle school. Set B is the seventh graders in the middle school. Of course, we're looking at the same middle school, hopefully. However, the students, the, all of the students in the middle school would be considered the full population on this one, pop population. And then set B here, seventh graders, that's only part of that population. So that would be considered a sample. Right, better E than that. There we go. Okay, and then part two, favorite flavors of ice cream. Set A, the customers at an ice cream shop in the town. And set B, the residents of the town. I would, I'm going to start with population on this one again. So population is all the residents in the town. And then the sample is part of the population, which is just customers at the ice cream shop in the town. Of course, are they the same residents of the, of the town? I don't know, but I guess we can assume that they are. So this should tell you something about the relationship between these two. A sample should never be bigger than the actual population that you're looking at. The students in Mr. Blackwell's class brought photos from their summer break. Table shows how many students brought each type of photo. What is the probability of a student brought a photo taken at the theme park? Okay, well, for this one, we're going to need to figure out how many total, uh, I guess, photos or students brought this in. So we're going to add these together. So nice way, right, the thing that's nice about this, it's already set up for us just to add these straight down vertically. So let's say 6 plus 4 plus 7 plus 11, and that is 28. So 28 students or photos, and uh, this is a probability thing, right? So say out of 28, because there were 28 total photos, and then we simply look into the table. This one wants to know how many students brought a photo taken at the theme park, and that shows 11 right there. So that would be 11 out of 28 brought a photo from the theme park. As a fraction, we cannot simplify this, but I will change it into a percent. Uh, 39.3? Yes, rounded 39.3, right? Very good. It's quite an ugly decimal. But if we yes. round it to the nearest tenth, then it looks a little bit more pretty, I would say. There are 560 students at the school where Mr. Blackwell teaches. Predict how many students would bring in a photo taken at the theme park. Now, 
see how we're making a prediction based off of 28 students? And you should ask, again, this is where you should ask more questions. Uh, well, is that an accurate representation? Well, perhaps, maybe socioeconomic status makes a difference. Maybe um, the age groups here make a difference. I don't know. But you should ask more questions right here. So, but it does want us to figure this out. I'm just going to use the original fraction that we had, the 11 28s right there. I think this is going to work better for a proportion. And this is a proportional relationship. So in the denominator, this is a part to whole relationship. This takes it back to what was that, unit 4 or 5? And now we're looking at 560 students total. That's all of the students at the school. So that's going to go in the denominator. Whatever we find in this numerator right here will be how many students we would expect to have taken a photo at the theme park, however relevant or accurate this would be. So it's just a prediction. I say just, but you have to be careful. I, I like to use fish method because it's so pretty. And so for this one, I'd say start with 560, multiply that by 11, divided by 28. And whatever I get out of this, I'm going to put in the calculator still. So 560 times 11 divided by 28. What do we get? Yeah, I got 220 as well. So the answer here is 220, but the answer is not 220. The answer is 220 students. And if you wanted to be more specific in your label on this one, say 220 students, we would expect to have a photo from the theme park. Good for you, but I'm not going to. The 39.3% is experimental because it was based on actual values that occurred, they happened. When we look at the 220 students prediction, that would be theoretical because we don't know if that actually did happen, although the prediction is based off of an experimental probability. It by itself is theoretical. Example two, a survey found that 85% of people use emojis in their text messages. Predict how many of the 1,280 students at Lakewood Junior High School use emojis. So this goes back to a percent problem, right? And you could use a percent proportion to solve this. And I like percent proportions because they're so pretty. And I get to use fish method. So I would put the percent right above 100. Oh, it's 85. 85%, 85 over 100 equals, and the, it says that 1,280 students is the full population of Lake Ridge Junior High School. So this 1,280 is in the denominator. It's the, all of the students. We would be solving for the unknown, which is part of the population right here. And again, for me, I do like fish method, perhaps more than I should. So that's 1,280 times 85 divided by 100. Now, as much as some of you could do this in your head, I cannot. So, I go to my calculator. Divide by 100, enter, and I get 1,088. Now, that's nice. It's just that 1,088 is not the answer because it's a word problem. You need to label it students. Now, does this mean exactly 1,088 students are going to use emojis? No. No, of course not. But it's a prediction to say, well, based on this statistic that we found at 85%, which is an experimental probability, then we would assume that this many students, or around that, right, would, would be using emojis. But, uh, again, you can kind of see how this can be used to sometimes even manipulate people's brains as the circle graph shows the results of a survey in which children ages 8 to 12 were asked whether they have a television in their bedroom. Predict how many out of the 1,725 students would have a television in their bedroom. So right here in this one with the circle, the pie graph right here, pie chart, whatever you want to call it, says that 46% of the students have TVs in their bedroom. So that's the percentage we're going to use. And since it is a percentage, I am going to use a percent proportion. Do you have to use a percent proportion? Of course not, but I'm going to. So here's our percent proportion. This is going to take us back a few units, which was so fun. And the percentage right here is given at 46%, so that always goes above the 100. 
This is out of 1,725 students. So that's going to be in the denominator. That's also the same as 100%. What I need to do is solve for this unknown. So I'm going to use the old fish method on this one. 1,725 times the 46 and divide by 100. And this will give us that value. So I'm still going to put it in my calculator. I know some of you guys did it, but I feel if I don't see it, then I, it's, not, it's not that I don't trust you. It's that I don't trust me. So I got uh, 793... I'm going to round this to the nearest tenth, even though there was no need to, because it was already 0.5. So, 793.5, but it's not 793.5. It's 793.5 students. students. Very good. So, always make sure that you're labeling these, because that's crucial. Yeah, how do you break the student? You don't, you don't break the student in half, you break the TV in half. Oh. Or, or you just mount it. Yeah, so, yeah, this brings up another question is, well, how do you have half a student? Well, remember, this is just an average. So you'd say, well, it, it should be in that range. And there are mathematical uh, uh, formulas that we can use to calculate the give and take on this. The error is what they call it, which should also tell you something about those averages because it's like, well, how can you mathematically do that? Well, they feel like they can as well. So uh, just be careful on that. Yeah, it's a good point. This is why you should read the question probably more thoroughly than I did. So let's, let's I'm going to go back there and let's, let's change this into children's. Although I wouldn't consider a 12-year-old a children myself, but it's up to you. Children. Okay. So here is 793.5 children's. Now that's, that have the TV in the bedroom, so I actually used the wrong uh, value on this one. Uh, but in order to calculate this one, it's not too hard. What we're going to do is take the value that was given, the total number of students, uh, sorry, children's, on this one, which was uh, 1,725. I'm just going to subtract the 793.5, and then that would tell me how many did not have a TV in the bedroom. So minus 1,725, yeah, 931.5. So this would be the more accurate answer, 900. 31.5. Again, I guess we're going to say this is children's. Although I know some eight-year-olds that are more adult than lots of adults. And I know some 12-year-olds that are less of a child than five-year-olds, but whatever. So fun. To get valid results, a sample must be chosen very carefully. An unbiased sample is selected so that it accurately represents the entire population. And some, some of course, saying something is unbiased is of itself kind of manipulative, but in any case, two ways to pick an unbiased sample are listed below. So these would be considered, I guess in academics anyways, unbiased, whether they actually are or not, I suppose you would have to decide, but simple random samples. Uh, so here's some descriptions and examples, and then there's also another classification, syst systematic random sampling. So simple random means that we're just, there's no real process to it, it's just, we're choosing people completely randomly to take some kind of survey or ask them questions or uh, even if it's an experiment rolling a dice just throwing it not like setting it down on a specific number then that would be more biased systematic random sampling is when you take and this is more specific because it is systematic and you say i'm going to look for every person entering the store and we're only going to ask every tenth person that enters the store our questions Okay, well, it's random still because we don't control who the 10th person is that goes into the store. But uh, it, it's systematic because we're, we're counting how many there are going into the store. And then every 10th person that goes in, we ask them a question on a survey or something like that. So those are considered unbiased. Considered unbiased. And really, you should be asking questions such as, well, how can you make an unbiased sample biased? Because it does happen. So these are considered biased samples, in, in which case the results we would consider either unfair or invalid. And so we would not really take those seriously, although you see them all the time. Really, you should just ignore the numbers com uh, completely. But a convenient sample is when something happens, well, conveniently, such as asking people if they like sports, but you go to the sports store to ask people if they like sports. Sports. Okay, that's convenient because they're already there getting sports stuff and 
you're asking them if they like sports. So uh, that would be convenient. A voluntary response would be like um, you being a soccer player and asking your fans if they like soccer. Uh, I, I see how that would make the results biased. Now, of course, not only should you ask questions with these, but just like with unbiased sampling, you should ask lot, lots and lots of questions about those, not only about the results, but where they came from and how they got there. Because if you don't, then you shouldn't trust any of that garbage. So here, example four, TV programming manager wants to conduct a survey to determine which reality television show is the favorite of viewers in a certain viewing area. Is considering the three samples shown. Draw an X through the two samples that would not fairly represent all the people in the viewing area. Which again, indicates that there's some manipulation here, but uh, just taking stuff at the surface as well is not usually a good idea. You should actually ask more questions than that. But, sample one says 100 people that are trying out for a reality show. Well, if they're trying out for a reality show, then chances are that they have a very specific kind of preference for television show watched, so that would be considered biased. Sample two, 100 students at your middle school. Uh, yeah, that, that seems okay, except it's at a middle school, right? So age plays into biasness. And so we'd say, nope, not this one either. Sample three, every 100th person at a shopping mall. Okay, that's systemic, right? or systematic, not systemic. Uh, systematic because we're looking at every hundredth person here. So yeah, that one checks off. That's a good one. Now, now again, this is completely academic. It would be considered random. It's determining on if this conclusion is valid or not. Valid meaning uh, biased or unbiased. Valid would be unbiased. And then there is this <laughs> cause of confusion because valid is not an un thing, but unbiased is. Uh, not thing, so it's kind of like the opposite of the unbiased, but meaning the same thing. I feel like there's a word for that, but I forget what it was. Is so we're just determining on this is is biased or unbiased. If it's unbiased, then it's valid. If it's biased, then it's considered invalid. So example six: a random sample of students at a middle school shows that ten students prefer listening to rock, fifteen students prefer listening to hip hop. And 25 students prefer no music while they exercise. It can be concluded that half the students prefer no music while they exercise. So, on this one, when I, I would want to figure out, and again, this is a experimental probability. I, I want to figure out how many students here were surveyed. 10 were, uh, are for rock, 15 for hip-hop, and 25 for no music. Yeah, that's a total of 50. Of those 50 students that appear to be surveyed here, 25 of them listen or prefer no music while they exercise. And uh, yeah, that would end up being 50% right there. Or I guess it was saying half, right? So that's one half. It's the same thing. So uh, yes, that would be true. Now again, just like we talked about in the previous example, is you should be asking lots of other questions. Is, is Does that mean there's only 50 students in the school? Are there... How many students are in the school? Because is 50 students enough to represent the entire school? Well, you have to decide. And they didn't give us enough information to make that determination. But when you see statistics like this, you should not only ask a few surface questions, but maybe some deeper questions, which you'll have to figure out on your own. Ever a 10th person who walks into a department store is surveyed to determine his or her music preference out of 150 students. Customers 70 stated that they prefer rock music. The manager, therefore, concludes that about half of all customers prefer rock music. So we're just trying to determine if the manager's conclusion is accurate. And it did say, it did even include this about, right? So you should be careful about about values or approximations. And yes, 70 is about half of 150. Um, I don't know the exact percent, but I also don't care because it is about half the customers. And this one is specifically for the customers. If, uh, if, the, if we change the question, though, to be more in the effect of is the manager asking if they prefer music? Well, it is a music store. 
surveyed a department store. I don't know what that means, department store, but whatever. Um, but this one, this one would be accurate still. It would be considered accurate academically, but um, again, you should be asking lots and lots of other questions about these values, especially how they come out so clean, like 70 and the 150 can be determined. But is 150 customers enough to make that determination? That's up to you. You have to figure that out on your own, okay? But yeah, I would say that this one is valid as much as I want to ask more questions. Customers of a music store survey to determine their favorite leisure time activity. The results are shown in the graph. The store manager concludes that most people prefer to listen to music in their leisure time. Uh, okay, so leisure time, uh, it looks like we're just trying to determine if this is a uh, valid conclusion or not on this one. Well, these are leisure time activities. So it looks like 6% of the people they surveyed it's like, hey, I like to play sports. 9% was like, I, I just do other things other than playing sports or listening to music. And then 85% here show listening to music, okay? Now, does that mean that there was only three options on the survey? We don't know. But again, it should bring up several different questions that you should ask. Are there maybe uh, some options that they should have included on the survey? Perhaps, but well, again, uh, for this particular problem, we don't know. Usually for published type statistics, you can find out this type of information, but welcome to math class. Um, so on this one, yeah, and that becomes the real question here is where, and this should be a question you should ask when people give you statistics such as this, is where were these people surveyed? Is the customers of the music store. So you think people going to the music store to... To find music, I know music stores don't really exist these days other than on the internet. But if they did, and you ask people, what do you do on your spare time? They would probably say listening to music. So for me, I say that this is an answer of no. Sorry, store manager. You have come to a, a correct conclusion. Now, remember, the conclusion is correct based on the statistics that are shown. But the statistics shown are biased or they are unfair. So naturally, we would say, you gotta be careful with that type of conclusion because you, I mean, if you go to a grocery store and ask people what they do, okay, that, would, that may be a little different. How about this one? Store sells three types of pants, jeans, capris, and cargos. Store workers survey 50 customers at random about their favorite type of pants. Survey responses are indicated in the table if 450 pairs of pants are ordered, how many should be jeans? Well, this one is just one of those percentage ones. So first thing we're going to do here is add the values together. All three of these values. That's not even hard. That's a 40, 50. Boom. 50. Looks like 50 pairs of pants. That's uh, favorite types for peoples. So it is going to be out of 50. And it says uh, preferred jeans. There's 25 out of 50. And as a proportion, we'd say, well, this should be equal to 450. It's really just half. So fish method, cross multiplication, um, scaling the fraction. It looks like we should get 225. So pairs of pants, how many should be, I guess, jeans would be our label for this one. So if 450 pairs of pants are ordered, we would expect approximately 225 jeans of those to be of those orders to be jeans, there we go. Yeah, is this valid or not? Well, is 50 enough to make that determination? I, I, I guess if you're looking at a really small business, probably, but if you're looking at something like Amazon, no, that would not be enough people to make that determination. Determine the conclusion's valid. Okay, the deter to determine the most common injury cared for in an emergency room, a reporter goes to the same hospital every afternoon for one month during the summer and observe people entering the emergency room, she concludes that a second degree burn is the most common injury. So, again, this may take a couple readings, especially while you're getting used to whether this is valid or not. So, remember that she is actually trying to figure out the most common injury for an emergency room. And where is she doing, where is she conducting this survey in the emergency room? What's the problem, though? That's correct. It's 
Not only is it in the summer, it's, also in the afternoon. it's in the afternoon. So people that have been out all morning have been getting a lot of sun. And again, we don't know where this was. Okay, like if you're at the summertime in the northern hemisphere and you're somewhere in the southern hemisphere and the people come to the sunburns, that could be problematic because there's less sunlight during that time, right? Remember the seasons alternate, right? Uh, but if you go to a desert or the beach and you go to that particular emergency room, yeah, you might get some people with some sunburns on that stuff. So yeah, this one we're going to say is invalid. Or if you, if you want to say, well, is it valid? No, it's the same thing. The, to evaluate the integrity of underground water lines, the Department of Public Works randomly selects 20 sites in the city to unearth and observe the water lines. At five of the sites, the water lines needed repair. The Department of Public Works concludes that about one-fourth of underground water lines throughout the city need repair. And again, this, this comes in with more questions. Well, how many total sites are there in the city? Is it a giant city? that has like 2,000 sites. Well, 20 isn't very much of that, so then it wouldn't. But just based on the information we're given, what they really want here is yes, because it was random. And five out of 20 is the same as one fourth or 25%. So the answer they're looking for here is yes. Although I would want to ask, again, I just, in my heart, I really want to ask more questions, but this is a slide and I can't ask questions of a slide. <laughs>